Okay, this is AP, AB, and BC, and we're doing Unit 1, Section 7, which is Selecting Procedures for Determining Limits. So essentially, this video is going to be a little bit of a review of previous videos where we do a bunch of examples of limits that look different and talk about how to evaluate them. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe use some of the skills that we learned in previous uh, videos with slightly different looking problems. So let's go ahead and start. So the first problem we're going to do for P1, and, and here I didn't call any of them examples because technically they're all practice, but I'm going to walk through them. So if at any point you want to pause uh, and not have me do it first, then please go ahead and hit pause. So here we're going to evaluate each limit. Now we haven't actually talked about a piecewise function uh, written as equations. We've seen them as graphs, right? We've seen piecewise functions as graphs where we see like a line segment and part of a parabola and some open circles and some closed circles. So here's the honest answer. When you look at this, um, the only points, so if you look at each one of these functions uh, by themselves, right? So like if you were to look at, at the three function rules, right? Which I'm gonna uh, go ahead and number one, two, and three. So if you were to look at number one, which is 10 minus x, and number two, which is x squared plus one, and number three, which is four x plus four, each one of those function rules are, are kind of boring graphs, right? Like the first one's a line, the next one's a parabola, the last one's a line. None of them are gonna have anything weird happening. The only weirdness in these graphs is gonna happen where you switch from one function to the other. Now, I always call them breakpoints. So this is a bit of a Hoganism, right? This is not uh, an actual math term, right? So, so I'm gonna call these breakpoints. And the reason I'm mentioning them is because when you look at these spots where you switch from one function to another, it's sort of like if you're a track runner and you're running a relay. Most kids running track will tell you that the trickiest part of it is the relay where you hand off the baton to someone else, right? Because you could drop it or you could break your stride or something could go wrong. I don't know. I'm not a track runner. I only run to food or from animals chasing me. So point being that the two weird spots are where function one, which is the 10 minus x hands off to function two, which is going to happen at x equals two. And then where function two, which is the x squared plus one, hands off to function three, which is the four x plus four, which is gonna happen at x equals five. Those are the only two weird spots. All of the other spots, I'm basically just gonna have a nice, happy, boring function. And if you recall from when we did the video with graphing, on those nice, happy spots in the middle of a graph uh, where nothing weird is happening, the function value is the same as the limit value. So basically, zero falls fully in window number one, right? So to find this one, I'm going to use function number one. I'm just going to put a little, actually, we'll put a one right there just to say that I'm going to use function number one, right? Because zero falls fully in the window where zero is less than two. It's not one of these break points, right? So I'm just going to get, this is 10, sorry, the thing's beach balling, 10 minus zero, which is 10. And that's it. I'm done. Okay. So when I go to the two though, two is gonna be tricky and five is gonna be tricky. Those are gonna be the two that are up here as breakpoints. So the issue with this is I'm actually gonna to have to look at the behavior on each side because on the left side of two, the function's using 10x, uh, 10 minus x rather. So the limit as x approaches two from the left of this function is going to be a 10 minus two. I know two isn't included here, but but that just means there's an open circle on the graph. This is still a graph that's happening immediately to the left of two. So I'm gonna get an eight. Well, on the right, I'm gonna use the next function. So the limit as x approaches two from the right of this function is going to be a two squared plus one, which is a five. So this double-sided limit does not exist because if you need a reason, eight is not the same as five, right? So again, two is special because it's that spot where I switch from one function to another. It's the baton pass, right, in the middle of a relay. Uh, when I go to use uh, x is three, three falls fully in the middle of this two to five window. So I'm basically just using the second function. So I'm just gonna do three squared plus one, right? And that's gonna give me a 10. It's an accident that it is also a 10. All right, but when I get to, to five, I'm gonna have to worry about two functions again, right? So when we get to five, notice that I'm using x squared plus one to the left of five and also at actual five, and that I'm using four x plus four to the right of five. So I'm gonna have to split this into two limits. The limit as x approaches five from the left of f of x is gonna be five squared plus one, which is a 26. The limit as x approaches five from the right of f of x is going to be a four times five plus a four, which is a 24, which means that this double-sided limit doesn't exist. Now, sometimes they do, right? It just happens that in this example, they don't exist, right? So, so they, they're not the same. So, so in this case, again, it does not exist. 
Now, had they both been the same number, if they were both a 24 or they were both a 7 or whatever, if they're the same number, then that's the answer. But in this case, it does not exist because they're not the same number. All right, so then last one, 8 falls squarely in the last section, right? 8 is all the way at the end, so it's using the third function. And I'm just going to go ahead and do 4 times 8 plus 4, which should give me a 36, and that's it. Okay, cool. Uh, so again, when you're looking at a piecewise function, you just have to worry about these breakpoints, right? You have to worry about those spots, and then beyond that, you don't have to worry too much about values that fall in each interval. All right, so let's go ahead and do a P2. You're going to evaluate the limit. Again, the first thing you should try doing is plug in and make sure that you don't get a number, right? So when I plug in, I seem to get a 2 times a regular 1 plus a 2 times a negative 1. So that's a 0 on top, which is already kind of worth noting. And on the bottom, I seem to get a 1 minus a 4 plus a 5, which is, uh, is going to be a... Yeah, okay, so we're good. Uh, so that's going to be a 6 minus a 4, which is a 2. So I get a 0. So your first thought when you see this is probably, oh, when I plug this value in, I'm going to get 0 over 0 and have to simplify. But it turns out you don't. You just get a 0 over 2, and that's your answer, right? Now, if you had bothered to try and factor, you could have factored, right? There's nothing wrong with factoring, right? But if you had factored this, uh, you would get, oh, the bottom's prime. The bottom doesn't factor. So that's the issue, is that the bottom wouldn't factor anyway. So there you go. All right, but you probably would have stressed yourself out a long time trying to factor the bottom, and it doesn't factor. So your answer is just 0. All right, uh, next we have a table for f of x, and we're asked to limit as uh, x approaches 3 of f of x. So on this side, right, from the left, I seem to be approaching a y value of negative 2. From the right, I also seem to be approaching a y value of negative 2. So my answer is a negative 2. Oh, my bad. Sorry, folks. There we go. So my answer is a negative 2. All right. Next one. All right, so now we're given two graphs. We're given uh, f and g, both piecewise functions, right? Uh, and we're asked to evaluate some limits that are sums or differences or various things. So I'm going to make the same argument I made before, that it's easier to find each individual limit first, right? So the limit as x approaches negative 4 of f of x. Well, here's negative 4 for f of x, and here's negative 4 for g of x. Now, a trick with g of x, there's not going to be a double-sided limit here, but remember, there's nothing over here on this other side. So so for f of x, both sides are approaching a y value of 1. So this is going to be a 1, right? That's this, this limit, right? And then the limit as x approaches negative 4 of g of x, right? Well, there is no left-sided guy on the curve. Like, there is literally no left, right? This, there's, no, there's no graph over here. So if there's no left side, then the right side and the double-sided limit are the same, and they're both a negative 3, right? So what's going to happen? is I'm going to get that this is a negative 2, right? So, so again, it's worth noting here that there is no left limit at x equals negative 4 um, for g of x, right? And the reason there's no left limit is because literally that's the end of g of x. g of x is only defined up to negative 4. It's not defined after negative 4. All right, so uh, now let's look at negative 1. So I'm going to erase some of the marks I made on the graph just for everyone's sanity, right? So now let's look at negative 1. So we want as x approaches negative 1 on both graphs. So here's the thing. I'm going to make the argument that as soon as I recognize part of this doesn't exist, I'm done. At negative 1, this one right here does not exist. I don't have to keep figuring out what the other limits are. It doesn't matter if the g limit exists because double of something that doesn't exist is still non-existent. So I'm done because this limit, the left and the right, are different things. So the double-sided limit at negative 1 does not exist for f. Um, so there's no point in doing the other work to figure out what the limit would be for g. All right, so now let's talk about 0. So at x equals 0, this limit, both of these sides seem to be going to negative 3. And at 0, both of these sides need, seem to be going to 2. So this is a 3 times a negative 3 minus a 4 times a 2, right? So I get negative 9 minus 8, and that's a negative 17. Last one is f of g of x, right, at negative 4. So remember, that's f of the limit as x approaches negative 4 of g of x. So remember, we already actually found the negative 4 limit for g of x, right? We found it right here. It was a negative 3. 
So that's f of negative 3. When I look over here, f of negative 3 is a 1. Okay, moving on. All right, so now we have uh, both a graph and a table, and we're going to answer some questions. Notice that all of these uh, seem to be talking about uh, x approaching either 1 or negative 1, right? Um, so let's go ahead and uh, figure, some, and some of them are left and right-sided limits, uh, like left only or right only. So let's go ahead and figure that out. So let's start with x approaching 1 for f and g, okay? So for f, as we approach 1, this does not exist, right? The double-sided limit does not exist. Once I recognize that this one right here does not exist, it doesn't matter what g is, right? Because does not exist plus a number is still does not exist, okay? Um, now let's look at negative 1. So as f approaches negative 1, or as x approaches negative 1 for the f function, this one turns out to be a 1. As we approach negative 1 here, both sides here seem to be approaching a negative 2, right? So this is going to be 2 times a 1 minus a negative 2, which I'm pretty sure is a 4. I'm going to erase some of the marks so that it's easier to see what's going on, okay? Um, as we approach negative 1 of f and g, well, we already found f and g, right? So you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Like, we already found... Um, we already did f and g at negative 1 in the last part, right? So, so we found f to be the 1, and we found g to be the negative 2. So if we want to go ahead and do f and g as we approach negative 1, it's going to be the 1 over the negative 2. And that answer's fine. If you want to make it a, a negative 1 half with the negative in front, that's fine. If you want to make it a negative point, fine, that's fine. All right. Uh, when we get to this one, we want the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of g of x. So let's, um, I'm going to come up here with this one so we have a little bit of space. So this is f of the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x, right? So uh, as we approach negative 1 for g, it seems to me that both of these sides are approaching a negative 2, right? So that's f of negative 2. When I go to negative 2, that seems to be a 4. So f of negative 2 is a 4, all right? Now the last two are left and right side limits. So remember when we did this first one, we got D and E because, because F didn't have a, a double-sided limit at 1. But F does have a, a left limit at 1 and a right limit at 1. So let's look at this. So F's left limit, so here's 1, right? The left limit, sorry, we're beach balling. There we go. Okay, so the left limit at 1, this guy right here seems to be a 1. And as G approaches 1, the left limit seems to be a 3. So this is going to be 1 plus 3, which is 4. Now the right limit, if we switch colors, hopefully we don't beach ball too much. There we go. Okay, at 1, the right limit is a 3 for f, and the right limit for g is also a 3. So we get 3 plus 3, which is 6, right? Now, interestingly enough, that jives with the answer that we got here, because if I asked you to do the left limit as we approach... Um, 1 for f plus g and the right limit as we approach 1 for f plus g, you're going to get two numbers. Those two numbers aren't the same, which is why it makes a lot of sense that the double-sided limit there doesn't exist. All right, last problem in this video. So this is a pretty common AP trick. So this is a common AP trick, and there's a bunch of ways to deal with this. I'm going to suggest that this is one of those graphs that's kind of worth knowing what it looks like. One way to deal with this is to plug in a couple numbers to the left of zero, to the right of zero. So let's say that you really just were not going to use a calculator and you didn't care to use the graph, right? Let's say you just wanted to plug in some numbers, right? One thing you could do is say, okay, here's zero, right? I know I can't plug in at zero, but let's just pick some easy numbers on this side of zero. Now, if I don't have a calculator, I'm going to want to pick really easy numbers, like not any of that 1.01, 1.0. I'm going to see if something happens here because I happen to know that there's a trick here that's going to happen, okay? So zero is the number I'm targeting. If you were to pick a negative one, or actually let's start at negative three. If you pick negative three, the absolute value of negative three is a regular three on top of a negative three. You're going to get a negative one. If you put absolute value of negative two on top of a negative two, you're going to get a negative one. If you put absolute value of negative one on top of a negative one, you're going to get a negative one. So what I want you to notice is that on the left, these are all going to negative one. On the right, if you put the absolute value of one over one, you're going to get a one. 
If you put the absolute value of 2 over 2, you're going to get a 1. And if you put the absolute value of 3 over a 3, you're going to get a 1. So what I want you to notice is on this side, these are all 1. So the left-sided limit is a negative 1, the right-sided limit is a 1, and the double-sided limit does not exist. That said, I kind of want to show you why. This is one of those graphs that's sort of worth knowing because it comes up a lot. Uh, again, as a trick question, but it definitely is a thing that you're going to see at some point on some AP or some practice AP. So let's figure out why it does this, right? So let's remember that an absolute value is fundamentally a piecewise function, right? So um, actually, let me... Okay, so an absolute value of x is fundamentally a piecewise function. For x values that make the inside negative, which in this case would be x values less than 0, this behaves as the opposite of x because it makes it positive. And for x values that would keep the inside 0 or positive, this behaves like a regular x because the absolute value doesn't do anything for positive values. That means that f of x is behaving like a negative x over x, which is the same as a negative 1 for x values less than 0, and a regular x over x, which is a 1 for x values greater than 0. Um, the equal to goes away because I can't divide by 0, right? So if you were to visually look at this, what you're going to see, sorry, I didn't mean to erase my, uh, my negative 1 for the left-sided limit. If you were to look at this graph, and I can show this uh, on a grapher as well, but if you were to look at this graph, this is basically what it looks like. Open circle goes this way, open circle goes this way. This is a jump, and we're going to talk about discontinuities later, but in theory from Algebra 2, you probably remember what a jump is. So um, you actually can see this if we graph it um, on a graphing calculator, right? If we go to our y equals and clear this out, we go to math over to number, we pick absolute value x divided by x, and then if I graph it, uh, we'll zoom 6. You'll see that it's got those two lines, right? And I could zoom in if you want, and you'll see it, but it's, it definitely does exactly what we just described, right? Now, you can't see on your calculator that there's an open circle, um, but if you hit trace, you'll see that when, you, when x is 0, you don't have a y value, right? So at 0, there's no y value. That confirms that there is an open circle here and also right here. So that's the gist. Um, so again, 1, negative 1, and does not exist.